if your harp were a character in in this piece or in this music how would it act what would it say you know is it a diva is it like an angel is it you know maybe a more of a bad girl hi grace how are you doing today i am great how are you victoria thank you so much for having me I'm doing well. I am so excited to meet you through Heather Downey's How to Heart membership. You came and talked to us about shining your light. And there's a part of me that really resonates with the content. And I think it's so important to shed light into what you have talked about, which we're going to get into. But before we do that, let's get to know you a little bit. Tell us sure. about yourself. How did you get, how did the hub get into your, your life? It's a great question. I always love starting here too, because everyone's story is so different. And like, how did we end up with this crazy instrument? Exactly. So I, um, I was a musical child, you know, I sang in the church choir, I played piano and um, my mom happened to meet a, a harpist who was the um, parent of someone at my school. And um, she was just talking to her one day and this harpist was saying that she was teaching her daughter how to play. And my mom was like, well, you know, Grace is maybe the same age. Maybe she could play the harp. And there happened to be a woman in town who's, um, whose husband had gone over to Ireland and brought her back this beautiful little dusty strings harp. And she was like, thank you so much, but I don't really want to play it. So it just sat there. And so my mom sort of put the two together. And so we started renting it and she was just sort of like, Grace, what do you think? You want to play the harp? And I was like, sure. You know, <laughs> I mean, I did a lot of other activities. And so at first I just sort of was like, okay, I'll play it. You know, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it. I think the trouble I had at first was that it just felt sort of solitary. You know, the only harpist I knew was my teacher. Um, and then uh, when I was 13, that was around when I, I started when I was nine. So when I was 13, we moved to the DC area. And that's when I met a new teacher who was a uh, the second harpist in uh, the National Symphony. And she, at this point I started to play a pedal harp and um, that summer, my mom didn't want me just sitting at home all by myself, you know, um, without knowing anyone. So she enrolled me in my first per performing arts camp. So I was playing with harp ensemble. I was playing in orchestra. I was playing in band and it just, everything came to life. You know, it just made the experience of music making so enriching. And I really just sort of caught the, the orchestra bug, you could say. So um, I just sort of kept following the path. And I will say, I, I wasn't, you know, I, I was aware of how challenging this field was, particularly getting into an orchestra. I knew this is not something you just walk into, send in your application and, you know, bada bing, bada boom. Like I, I knew it was going to be challenging. So um, I basically just got as much experience as I could. I played in all of the, you know, school orchestras. I did a lot of festivals um, and I, I sort of really just focused in on the audition path, which, um, you know, um, has its ups and downs. Of course, um, there were many, many auditions I took and some went well and some didn't go so well. And, you know, in the process, I had to learn a lot, uh, you know, as we'll talk about, about mental health and dealing with performance anxiety. Um, and, um, but I, I was really fortunate to have some great resources um, when I went to Juilliard they had actually just started a performance psychology department. And um, the a couple years later, I was down at the New World Symphony in Miami Beach, um, which is sort of a, a training ground for young aspiring, you know, orchestral musicians. So they would bring down these coaches, uh, performance coaches to, to work with us and to sort of, um, you know, learn that there is some method to the madness here. It's not to sort of show up, cross your fingers and, you know, wear your lucky underwear, although I've certainly tried that as well. Um, so it was definitely a, a really amazing experience. My, my first job job was with the Dallas Opera in Texas and a place I had never been until the audition <laughs> and I actually loved it I was there for four years um, in the process I started playing with the Santa Fe Opera 
in the summers. So definitely got my opera feet wet and ended up loving that. And then I came up here to Rochester, New York about five years ago to join the Philharmonic. So I now have, you know, most of my time here in New York, and then I spend the summers in Santa Fe. So I have that really beautiful balance of symphony and um, an opera. And um, I'm just, I, I feel very, very, very blessed. And uh, I'm now really excited to start to give back in this time in my career, um, reflecting on, you know, almost 20 years in the field. And yeah, as you know, you, you learn a lot in this path. <laughs> so definitely. And what an amazing journey you have had so far. And there is so much that uh, we need to unpack in there. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I, we, I, um, I look at your website and I see that you have studied in many different places in school. And I've always loved asking guests who have done a lot of study for some of the biggest takeaways, something that you just really feel like every harpist who is wanting to go down the path needs to remember. What are some of your big takeaways from your years as a harp student? Yes. Beautiful question. Um, I think um, one of the one of the things that I would certainly go back and I think tell myself was, or at least remind myself of, is the importance of connecting with your peers, with your colleagues. It's not only about taking the classes and you know studying with your teacher and practicing. Um, a part of the tuition really that you're paying for is the social connections that you are making. And, and, and I don't mean, okay, you know, friend them on Facebook, make sure they know who you are and what your resume is like to truly collaborate and to support each other because the friends that I've made, even at, you know, I, I ended up going to two different schools for undergrad. I transferred, um, at one point and and so I ended up having sort of twice the connections that I originally anticipated and you know at the time of course I was really worried about transferring and feeling like I was going to get behind but I really feel that I gained so much more from that experience from having the enhanced social connections from having the experience at both a conservatory and a university so really being open to that and staying true to like what your needs are if you find yourself in a situation that's just not the right environment, trusting yourself to look elsewhere. Um, and uh, I, I think, and then when I went to Juilliard, I'll be honest, I, um, this was definitely, I think one of the, one of the first big times that my imposter syndrome kicked in, you know, it started even with my audition. I felt so bad about my audition. Um, at this point, my performance anxiety was pretty high. So I went in and played. I did not feel like myself at all. I, a few things went well, but mostly I thought, well, that's it. So long. Thanks for having me. You know, I literally left the audition and went and cried in the bathroom. Like that's how I felt it went. So getting in, of course, I was thrilled, but I, I went there really feeling like I I didn't belong, like they made a mistake, you know? <laughs> that must be and, a very uh, interesting paradox to for you to work through. Oh yeah, I know because I, and I'm looking around and there are people in my studio whose names I've known since they, they were winning a competition since they were 14, you know, like Jane Yoon was in my studio. You know, again, I had, they were like posters on my wall of her, you know, and I'm like, well, how do I, I don't compare to this person. So it's really hard to get out of that sort of state of, of comparison. And I think what's important is to shift from, oh gosh, they can do this. Oh gosh, they can do this to, wow, I can learn this from them. Um, amazing that they have this skill. And to also realize that we don't all have to be in the same place. I felt when I went to Juilliard that I was incredibly behind. Um, even though I was a first year master's student, there were actually no undergrads that year. So I sort of felt like a freshman again. <laughs> I was like, oh gosh. Um, and I remember, you know, on the, my, one of my last lessons, my teacher, you know, Nancy Allen, I, I, I was asking her, how do you keep, you know, getting better? And she basically told me, you know, play a lot of Bach, um, <laughs> you know, keep learning solos. And, and she said, you know, don't worry, I, I think you're going to be a late bloomer. And <laughs> I, I really took that to heart because I, I really believed that I only had a certain amount of time to get better. And it, once I graduated, I'm cooked, but that is so not true. I mean, 
I have learned so much since that time. My technique has developed in so many ways and not just on my own. I've still worked. I continued to take lessons. I continued to seek out um, coachings and, and lessons with people who whose playing I really admired. So the learning continues always. So just remembering that I think helps to take some pressure off of this um, sort of the time cooker that school feels like. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, just allowing the curiosity and the love for the process to be your, your guiding light. You know, I actually still miss like writing papers. Like I miss, you know, um, going to class. Like there's so much about that structure that is so special, which is again, sort of why I'm coming back into writing now and all those other things. So yeah, I think just really being open to the experience um, and trying to really see everyone as your friend and someone you can learn from. So lovely. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's beautiful to remember that we can always develop regardless where we are. I love that idea of taking yes. away that boundary that we yeah. artificially set ourselves. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's been a game changer. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about playing in orchestra because you have been doing this a lot. And yeah. there are a lot of people, you know, myself included, when we when we show up, we see the harp and people are playing, everything is going hunky dory. <laughs> yeah. Is there any mishaps or things that are really memorable that could like, okay, yeah, this is something that maybe people need to know that, you know, being an orchestra harpist is cool. not necessarily all that you we can see with our eyes when we're yeah. here. It's a great question. There is so much that happens um, behind the scenes. And, and we're going to even dive into some of that stuff more later about the what's going on in your head. Oh, <laughs> sure. Oh, my gosh. Else. Right. <laughs> it's a totally another level. Exactly. Um, I think, man, being a harpist in orchestra, it is such a unique job. And I mean, one that I am so grateful for. Um, and truly, it's a job that changes every single week based on what's on your music stand, who is on the podium and who you're playing with. I mean, most of the time, you know, I'm playing here with Rochester or I'm playing in, in Santa Fe um, with the opera orchestra, but I sub a lot with other groups. And um, it's so interesting because um, there is still sort of this general hierarchy, right? And um, even though I am the principal of my section, you know, I'm sort of my own boss, you know, we all do pretty much answer to the, the conductor. And when I first got my, my job while out in, in, in Santa Fe, you know, um, there is, uh, well, really in any job, there is a probationary period where, you for maybe a two, three, or even four years in Santa Fe, it's four years, um, you are sort of reviewed by your audition panel. And um, this process can take many forms. Um, in Santa Fe, it was basically, um, I didn't really get any feedback officially or not. I mean, I, some people would say, hey, good job, you know, <laughs> but there was, there was not like a meeting where we say, hey, this is going well, we'd like you to improve upon this. Um, and then come the beginning of your fourth season, boom, you're tenured. There's no letter, there's no celebration, you show up for your first rehearsal, and there it is. Um, so wow. <laughs> we, we start our first note, and my friends look over to me, and they're like, thumbs up, like, you got it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so I don't mind the hands off, but, you know, there are still a lot of situations you find yourself in where you may still be navigating feedback, you know, um, mm -hmm. at what point, um, you know, a member of our, our wind section came over to me and told me that he thought I sounded, um, flat. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Cause you know, I'm tuning to 442. <laughs> Most people tune to 440. That's like the harpist's greatest secret. Like we don't really tell people what we tune to because they freak out, but there's something about the pitch. It tends to sort of sink. And plus we're playing outdoors. So we have to sort of tune sharp. So I said, well, do you want me to tune to 443? And he said, well, sure. You know, <laughs> okay, I can do that. But at the same time, I'm also like, why is this person telling me how I should, to, you know, he's not on my audition, you know. Um, so there is maybe that 
certain hierarchy that um, I'm, I, w that we all have to be sensitive to. And, mm -hmm. you know, for a while I did tune sharp, but I, at the same time, I also went back and I listened to the archival recordings from the last couple of weeks because I wanted to know truly how I thought I sounded. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of a relief to me because I could hear and I could say, well, I trust that this actually does sound good, but I will go ahead and make this change because I want to be a team player and um, say la vie, you know? Um, and I mean, we actually joked about it last year um, because it had been literally, it had been five, six years. And I, and I think he said, <laughs> he actually told me this last summer, he said, yeah, I think I think you sound sharp. And I said, you know, that's funny because I'm pretty sure you said the exact opposite thing five years ago. <laughs> he said, really? Like he didn't even remember. Isn't that interesting? I, f I think that's where, in my opinion, draw a big difference between someone playing in an orchestra than a solo, because in an orchestra, you working with a collection of other people that you may or may not know what's coming away from them. <laughs> yeah. And so it is, it is collaborative and um you know there's there is definitely the question of of boundaries you know um and um there's there are times when i feel the feedback may not be appropriate or i may not heed it you know one time someone told me you know i think you're playing too loud and i'm like well how do you, you're sitting right next to me you know you don't know what it sounds like out there and this person was worried about their solo being heard and I'm like oh honey you know um so the other thing that comes up a lot is because there are there's only one of us usually there might be a second harpist who comes in from time to time but the principal harpist in most of these orchestras you know before I came in and won the job was someone who had been there for 40 to 45 years so everything that your colleagues know or think they know about the harp they learned from your predecessor mm. and so i think the other thing i really had to learn was what historical precedent they set not because i need to go do that thing but for example i usually show up to a performance around 30 minutes before sometimes less if the harp's already there you know um, and if we've already been rehearsing, you know, we'll do 12 to 15 shows, you know, the same opera. So, you know, it becomes like, you know, just riding a bike, you show up, you do the thing. It's great. But my predecessor used to show up an hour and a half before the show and she would tune and then she'd move her harp and then she'd practice and then she'd tune her harp again. And, you know, and it was this big system and everyone was used to it. So at first when they didn't see me there by a certain time, my personnel manager would get worried and he'd start asking people, have you seen Grace? You know, <laughs> why do you need me? Like half of the orchestra isn't even here yet, but he just expected that I should be there mm. because that's what my predecessor did. So we sort of just had to have a talk about that, you know, and I, I, I wanted him to know that I take this job very seriously. Um, I, I know it's different uh, that I show up at this time versus what my predecessor did. Um, so I just want to clarify that this is what I need. And, um, you know, if there's a, if they need me here by a certain time, if there's something logistical that needs my attention, just let me know. But as far as I know, everyone's okay with this. So, you know, we could sort of make it a, a conversation. Um, and um, that that is that is important. So I think the more that you can just be open to the intel surrounding what the predecessor was doing and, and of course befriend them too. I've always, always become friends with the person before me. When I moved to Rochester, believe it or not, the, the person who had my job before me, her name is also Grace. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. And she still lives here. And so, you know, everyone joked, they're like, oh, Grace too. Okay, this makes it easy, you know, for me. And, um, you know, we'll meet for, you know, crepes or sandwiches and, and she's just, she's lovely. And so, um, I think that's also just really important because you always, even if you're doing things different than them, you want to honor them. You don't want to say, well, I can't believe they, whatever. No. Okay. Yeah. Totally get it. That's what they did. This is what I'm going to do. And no, no, you know, no, no bad blood. Of course, this is always like, um, just keeping it positive. You yeah. Know? This is what they did. And this is what you're going to do. And yeah. both can make sense. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly now, let's let's talk about working with someone that is a little bit different your husband yeah. benjamin is also a musician plays the cello 
how is that for you to have someone in your life that also speak the language of music? Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's, um, to be honest, I've almost exclusively dated musicians because they are the people we see. They are the people. They speak who, your love language. <laughs> they do. They do. And, you know, um, it's really interesting because, I mean, Benjamin and I are very different. Um, you know, he uh, he's way on the other side of the orchestra, um, you know, in the back of the cellos. He's been here for 15 years. He comes in, he keeps his head down. You know, he doesn't really like the spotlight um even though he is a star um he's just he's very um he's sort of shy and um and meanwhile I'm you know somewhat boisterous you could say and um <laughs> you know I um I'm a lot more extroverted and um so we still have plenty of of differences but I think it's been really fun um you know we actually started dating during the pandemic and uh, he had just been like a friend for a long time. I mean, I, I sort of, I really hardcore friend zoned him because I, I did really like him, but I also felt like we weren't, we weren't there yet. And for once in my life, I wasn't going to rush into a relationship. I was like, no, we're going to, we're going to be friends. We're going to be friends for as, for as long as possible. And in that process, we, we were able to develop a sort of a deeper level of trust um and we also started playing together you know we actually both went to the same church so we would you know sometimes perform there and then of course we both played for the same orchestra so we started doing outreach online together and you also learn a lot when you work with someone one-on-one -on -one. you know it's obviously very different from being in orchestra you you know um and how do you point out like oh i i think you're rushing here you know right? how do you give that feedback now <laughs> I'm not always very good at it. It's so funny. I really, so, and even just finding time to rehearse. Sometimes we're like, yeah, we'll rehearse, you know, and then we keep doing whatever we're doing in our life. And we realize, oh, why don't we just schedule this like normal people do? Like, when are you free? Let's put it in the calendar, you know, and then we'll set our instruments out. Um, but I think um, it's it's been a really um, fun part of of our career to, really develop um, music that we really want to play that's outside orchestra that's outside solo music and a lot of it ends up being popular stuff like I you know we we just played a library concert the other day um and we played like Leonard Cohen and um Fun. let it go from Frozen and you know I mean like and you know and and the swan and you know Mendelssohn's song without words like we, we really like to do a blend. Um, and then, you know, uh, one of our favorite things too is to even take pieces that are originally for opera or orchestra and sort of um, not water them down, but to extract what we can from the score and put it in between our two instruments um, and see how we can bring those colors to life in these smaller, in this smaller, more intimate setting. It's just fun because I think it gives us the freedom of expression that we don't always get in orchestra. We get to pick what we play, we get to pick when we play it, we get to play, pick how we play it. And I think that's just a really important balance to have when you are doing uh, a more regimented uh, performance career in orchestra that you still have those outlets. Yeah, that's amazing. And the video that you have, I've seen of the two of you play, it was really beautiful. So I'm hoping I hope you're going to oh. post more because the yes. music is lovely. And those two instruments do go together really well. They go so well together. And especially the cello has this insane range. They can go super high, like in the falsetto and then super low, like a bass. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I think our ne the next thing we really want to do is get like a looping machine so we can have like layers. Fun. I know. I know. We just need to figure out the technology, which is a little scary right now, but we'll You'll keep you posted for sure. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> Well, now we're going to talk about something that is very near and dear to both of us, which is the mental health aspect of, I, I would say it's not just about being a musician, it's just being human. Mm -hmm. um, and it is something that I don't think we 
uh, necessarily want to talk about because a lot of us is afraid of, of it. It's almost like something that we just don't want to approach it. But I really love the way that you share your experience and now are helping people. So I would like you to tell us a little bit about your mental health journey um, that you have uh, been through in your career and why is this topic so important for you uh, to, to shine a light in it? Absolutely. So yeah, um, when I was, let's see, um, when I was 18 years old, I was about to, you know, leave home for the first time and go to a conservatory and try to pursue a career in music, you know, all of these unknowns. And um, it was enough to, um, to trigger some um, uh, obsessive compulsive um, tendencies that I had actually had when I was really little too, you know, I would do things a certain number of times or, you know, don't step in the cracks, like all of that kind of stuff. And it was at the time sort of understandably dismissed as like, okay, well, she's a little quirky, you know, <laughs> okay, that's, uh, whatever, what is she doing now? You know, um, and um, to some extent, I think I, I outgrew them, you know, I stayed, I was very busy. I had a lot of activities. And, you know, of course, my parents were always really supportive. I, I was also one of six. So there was like, it was a big family operation and there was always a lot to distract me. And at this point, I was the only child left at home and, you know, feeling this intense pressure of what's going to happen next. And so, um, yeah, it really started as like intrusive thoughts and what's so hard about thoughts is how real they feel. They tell you, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. Something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with you. You're like, yep. Mm -hmm, yep. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and all you want to do is stop thinking that thought. But if you're telling yourself to stop thinking the thought, guess what you're doing? You're thinking the thought, right? So it becomes this awful carousel of, talk about a loop <laughs> yep it's literally ruminative thinking and when I went into the psychiatrist for the first time I couldn't believe when she told me like yeah this is something that people have like this is a thing I really thought I was just doing it to myself so what's really tricky um is that the the anxiety because you you can't understand it or where it's coming from you start to blame yourself and um, this happens also, you know, with depression, which I've also struggled with, you know, why am I feeling this? Just stop feeling it. Just stop thinking this. Just, just get over it. Right. Um, but I, I, I needed help and um, it came in, in a few forms. Right. Um, I, I did start taking medication um, and maybe more importantly, I, I started seeing a therapist. Um, it's so important that um that mental health not be dealt with as um something that is exclusively something that can be treated with a pill or exclusively something that can be treated holistically or exclusively something that can be dealt with with a th you know there are so many different um approaches and honestly i found that i kind of need to try to use them all um because at, well, at the time, it feels almost like a, not a death sentence. It feels like, it feels like you're being stamped. It feels like you're being labeled. And this diagnosis feels like something you'll never outlive. Um, at the same time, it was uh, really a blessing in disguise because it, it enabled me to become self-aware in a way that I, had never needed to um, to be, and as scary as it is, I mean, I I really had to um, try to look within myself and also start to address the underlying issues. Usually, intrusive thoughts don't just to totally come out of nowhere. Like there is usually something deeper that you may be avoiding like a much deeper fear that your body just has no way of processing like it's just too much and so you're like you know what i'm just gonna obsess about what time it is yep i'm just gonna look over here for the next 45 minutes you know like anything to to stay safe you know it's just the body's response so i learned you know a lot of techniques to 
um, to, you know, stay present, to come back um, and to eventually really allow those thoughts. That's the hardest part of anxiety. A lot of people feel like they just need to shut them down. Whereas, at least for me, the truth is anxiety, it doesn't really go away, but you can learn to amp up your the other voices, the true self, the inner mentor, the, um, you know, the, 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 the part of you that, that is self-aware and to notice first when those thoughts are present to, you know, allow to say, okay, this is happening. And, and then to, to basically come back to the thing that is grounding, that is present for you. It can be as simple as your breath. It can be as simple as just feeling your seat in the chair, you know, um, uh, or just getting up, moving around, feeling your body. And that itself becomes a muscle. So even when I'm, you know, playing and the inner critic gets really noisy, I have to first recognize that these thoughts that are happening, they're not me. And then the question is, well, okay, well, where are they coming from? <laughs> like, what, what is that, right? And what I've also, you know, learned and that I'm starting, the reason why I'm also starting to coach this is that the body has a natural protective response to any perceived dangers. Even if it's as simple as like talking to the cute barista behind the counter. It's going to be like, no, 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 no. You need to run away. This is not the time to do that. That person obviously doesn't want to talk. They will just come up with reasons because it's from that protective place. Same thing when you're going out on stage. Same thing when you're, yeah, just doing anything outside your comfort zone. Your body still goes back to those sort of pre-caveman days where it's like, no, no, don't go into the field where no one has hunted before. You could get attacked by a bear. You know, it still doesn't know the difference between true threats and perceived or imagined threats. So once you realize that, you can kind of, instead of being like, okay, shut up, don't think that. Like that actually doesn't work. It ends up getting louder. But what you can do is to kindly acknowledge where that is coming from. Okay. I see you, you can call it anything you want. You can give it a name, you can call it the ego, you can call it Miss Martha. I mean, literally anything, usually something that maybe makes you giggle a little bit because sometimes it really does say funny things. You're like, what, what are you worried about right now? You can say, okay, thank you, Miss Martha. I know you're trying to protect me, but I'm actually good. You know, I prepared for this or, you know, I know this person's gonna be happy to say hi to me and I'm gonna go for it. Thank you. And you just keep doing the thing. And eventually those voices get a little quieter. You can literally just start to turn them down a little bit. And, um, you know, I mean, it still happens. I'm still performing. And right before I put my hands on the strings, this voice is like, do you know the notes? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Go. You know, I mean, it's so funny, but it's, they're just, they're just there and we just learn to, to coexist. So it's sort of a relief to know, yeah, you can have sort of crazy thoughts, but that doesn't mean that you are crazy. You just coexist with them. That is so eye-opening because when we think about playing the harp, at least when I was starting, right? You were just like, yeah, I hit the right note, it's all good, right? You, you, we're not concerned about, you know, oh, other people watching me. Well, until you start wanting to perform, then, that other side of being a musician suddenly become very real. And yes. I have seen a lot of people, especially like adult learners who are hoping to get into performance or start playing for others. They're like, yeah, I froze. I, I keep telling myself I'm not good enough. That inner cr mm. critics keeps coming up or that imposter syndrome keeps showing mm. up in different shapes or form. Yeah. Um, and we almost feel wrong to feel that way. And then we feel bad about feeling wrong that we are wrong, oh, yes. right? Like, you know how it goes into that. It's like a, cycle. a sucker punch, <laughs> right? It's like, you're not ready for this. And then you're like, oh gosh, okay, I'm not ready. And then it's like, how dare you think that about yourself? And you're like, oh gosh, right? I'm the worst. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and I can only imagine how much more that feeling got amplified when you're in the business 
of having to show up and let other people judge you and audition right on a constant yes. basis yeah that's that absolutely must be very uh challenging and so yeah i mean i think what i what i had to learn was that um you know when we're putting ourselves in these stressful situations um to first of all expect for there to to be that that really heightened response and rather than you know like i was i was saying in my workshop rather than just jumping into the deep end and saying okay i'm going to go and just perform for 100 people right now you know take a minute take a week or a couple weeks and just practice performing it is different than practicing practice right when you practice something you're sort of playing you're yeah you might run through a section or maybe you run through the whole piece but it's a completely different scenario when you are in your safe space versus when there is another person present or even a recording device right suddenly it changes it it takes us out of ourselves so rather than just again going from a to z just start with applying small amounts of digestible pressures that's not going to you know throw you completely um but that can help you build your stamina over time mm -hmm. so you get used to what that response is like and that response it is a physical autonomic response from your nervous system it's the fight or flight response so it, it it's gonna probably happen on some level and everyone reacts differently so once you go through that you can then start to say okay so how did this feel where was my energy was I really, really, really up? Was I maybe kind of too down? Was I sort of frozen, right? There are so many different responses. So you start to learn um, what to expect and then you can modify your energy accordingly. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, building courage is something that you can do away from the heart. So, and that's, for me, that's the fun part. Like, I really, really like doing things away from the harp that can still, that can build character, like taking, even just taking a cold shower. Oh my gosh. It is like, I mean, that literally, it stimulates that same response in your body and it makes you stronger over time. I mean, and the, the, for some reason now, every time I go on Instagram, it's like cold therapy is like all yeah. I see. I'm like, oh my gosh. It's like, I'm just like shivering thinking about it. But um, you know, or like I tried, um, rock climbing, right. And this was something I wouldn't let myself do for a long time. Cause I was like, I need my hands. I can't do anything to my hands. And, but well, okay. I can do things in moderation, right? Like let's, let's try it. And I remember the first time I'm, you know, of course I'm all saddled in. I'm, 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 what is it? I'm bullied, uh, belayed. I'm belayed. There we go. Not bullied. <laughs> I'm so I'm, I'm harnessed in, I'm safe, but you get up to, you know, 30 feet and you look down and you're like, oh, Oh my God. You know, and you're still afraid to like, let go, you know, cause you're like, I, I don't, I, I don't trust this, you know? And then, and then you do, and you're like, oh my gosh, I did it. I did this thing. I did this thing. I didn't think I could do. It can be anything, um, you know, um, but just taking little risks help you to just practice getting out of that comfort zone. So again, it's just like a muscle, just like anything else mm -hmm. you practice, the more you do it, the more comfortable you feel doing it. And it's so reassuring to hear that there are things that we can do to make this seemingly uncontrollable situation to be a little bit more sort of within our control. And oh, yeah. that's the kind of work that you're doing now, isn't it, as a coach? Tell us about that. Yeah. And like, what kind of people do you work with? And what is it like to work with a coach who specializes in performing and preparing ourselves to perform? Totally. So I really, I see myself as, yes, a, a coach. At the same time, I'm also like your cheerleader. Um, and I'm going to be the person that you can come to with, you know, any and all of the, you know, the challenges, the weaknesses and the strengths that you experience when you are in that process of going from practice room to stage, to audition, to wherever it is. And what my job is, is just to facilitate and support that practice so that you, so that you, 
you have the experience of of doing say mock auditions or mock performances or my favorite i love adversity training um which is again throwing additional pressures on the person um which of course in the moment they're like why are you making me do this and then they go to perform after and they're like well that was a lot easier than the stuff you were making me do you know you know like so when i was younger i i i was a competitive swimmer and i swam for you know 10 10 years a lot of time in the pool and i remember people would sometimes wear uh drag they called it so they'd put on an extra suit maybe even leggings maybe even take their cap off so that they would feel slower in the water and they'd have to work harder so what we're doing with adversity training is sort of the same thing we're making the process of performing just a little bit more distracting. It can be literally just, um, and I do this on Zoom all the time with my clients. So I'll, um, you know, they'll be running through something and I will unmute myself and just like holler out distracting things, make, you know, really annoying sounds. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, to, you know, once we've gotten, we've built up some building blocks, I may take the form of the inner critic. I may be that voice that's, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just don't think it's good enough. You know, not, and they know this is not really me. This is just that practice of, because when you hear someone else say it, you're sort of like, wow, I can't believe I say this to myself. Like it sort of just helps you separate it even more clearly from yourself. I even had an ex-boyfriend do this to me and believe me, he knew all the things to say to get me going. I was like, mm -mm, he did not just compare me to that harpist, you know, but it, so there's those sort of emotional or um, noise distractions, which are huge. Mm -hmm. I also like doing, adding physical distractions. So I will literally, um, and I, of course I've done this to myself, you know, we'll put on, um, absurd layers of clothing um my one of my clients put on like a really awkward fur coat and like did a whole mock audition in it it was hilarious you know big dangly earrings that like hit the side of the harp because it's just like ooh, you know maybe you make your bench a little too tall maybe you wear rain boots or like not the harp shoes you want to wear and you know once I was trying to do this with a student they're like but I would never do this this isn't realistic and I'm like yeah that's not the point the point is that you get used to the discomfort in the moment and that when your body and that left brain is coming in saying, this is not okay, this doesn't feel good, you can still come back to the music and just do your best every time. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be perfect. And that's, that's the other thing that we really need to get away from is this uh, ideation of perfectionism because it does not, does not exist. Um, and one of the people I worked with a lot, you know, from, from Juilliard and who came down to New World is Noah Kankiyama. And um, he and his, um, you know, another one of the main um, uh, sort of fathers of the field, Don Green, talk about not perfect or great performance. They, they use the word optimal. And this is huge. This is just such an important shift because we start to feel like, oh gosh, if I make any mistake, it's just, it's over. And, you know, and I always tell this to my clients, I mean, I've never played a perfect audition in my life and I've won more than one audition, you know? So it's just, it's important that we get away from that and instead learn that once we're out of the practice room, we're not focusing on what's going wrong and what we need to fix, that instead we're focusing more in the right brain, we're focusing on the storytelling, we're focusing on what we want them to hear and hearing the things that we love in our playing. And that shift is just so huge because if you're in that critical space, you're not gonna be in your peak performance state. We actually do need to learn to sort of turn that off. And um, even when those voices come in to come back to that singing brain, that sound, so that's a, another thing that we work on is really exercises where we're actually singing and playing at the same time. Um, and it's so interesting because somehow we'll turn off that voice and we'll just be sort of playing mechanically, but it's 
really this is if anything like 60 to 70 percent of what i'm thinking about is how i want to sound it's not hearing what's happening and analyzing it it's thinking of it first and then letting it come through so it's again just developing sort of those skills and and learning how to um take time before the piece to really get centered so uh, this happens all the time with students or clients they'll just pull the heart back and go blah, blah, blah. i'm like whoa 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 <laughs> what just happened you know take a breath let's learn let's center our energy mm. hear what you want to have happen lock into the pulse and often even just the pulse the subdividing of the beats that you're playing that's your cruise control that's where you that's where you lock in. Um, so taking time to get into that state of mind and, and knowing it's gonna take practice, you know, it's not gonna happen immediately, um, but just becoming familiar with that, with that process. So you can just more easily play the way you wanna play. Love it. And I love that there are people that are coaching and helping other people in dealing yeah. with that. Cause I think, yeah, there's, there's so much more to playing the harp than just plucking the right string. Uh, and I yeah. that you're sharing all those experience and techniques that you have learned yeah. over the years. It's true. And I do mind. feel like harpists sometimes tend to be a little bit more isolated. And it, I mean, we're lucky that again, there are so many more people like Heather who are coming up with these beautiful memberships, which give people a chance to come together. Um, but I, I think because we're, we're not always working with other instrumentalists, we sometimes, um, tend to feel a little bit more alone in this mm. process. So for now, I am I, I am mostly working with harpists because these are our people, but um, I do want to really open it up. And um, I mean, already sometimes I'll, I find myself in conversations with colleagues or friends who, um, and I start to find myself sort of wearing the coaching hat and I have to be like, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> am, I, am I being friend raised right now or am I? <laughs> Um, and it's, it's a really beautiful thing actually, because, um, just like with anything, of course, I feel my own sense of imposter syndrome. I'm like, who am I? I don't have the answers. Of course I don't. But, um, my own experience is, uh, is enough that I can at least share what has worked for me. Um, and what I plan on doing is actually continuing to, study coaching and I'm working with a few coaches. So I'm going to be doing sort of more apprenticeship model stuff so that I can get more into the, what they call true coaching, which isn't so much telling people what to do, but actually really sort of drawing out of them, you know, what they want and finding those deeper truths um, to do the, the deep work, which sounds really exciting. So that's sort of the next frontier for me. Love it. And you're also sharing your writing skills with us in your blog. Yeah. Tell us about your blog. What can we expect? And it yeah. has a really fun name. <laughs> <laughs> the Pursuit of Harpiness. I know, let me tell you, that was in the pipeline for like a year or two. Um, I, I just knew that there was so much I wanted to share, not only about mental health, but also truly the pursuit of becoming a harpist, of becoming a musician a, 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 in a very competitive field. And um, there are so many things that I, I learned along the way that, you know, no one really prepares you for. And it's no one's fault, of course. Some of the stuff, uh, I, I call it like, I call it adulting, right? <laughs> and um, really. it's like those situations when, yeah, what do you do when the concert master tells you you're playing sharp? You're like, um, thank you, uh, you know, uh, you know, or, or, how do you handle, um, you know, someone, maybe a, a, a bullying situation at work, you know? Um, I've been involved with a lot of different, you know, scenarios, um, but there's also like fun stuff, you know? It's like, how do we, um, how do we keep this really important relationship with our instrument fresh, right? So the one I'm, I'm actually working on now is based on an exercise I developed with my clients called Date Your Excerpt. Um, and it can be really any music that you're working on, but we tend to really isolate our practice to just, you know, that hour or whatever with the harp, we say, okay, I'm gonna work on this thing. And 
it's so important to be able to stand back and sort of get a feeling for why, like what is what does this piece mean to you? What is your connection to the composer? What is their story here? And how can you make it your own? So I, I tested it out this last weekend with uh, an excerpt from Britain's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. And I made a point of using as many different sort of intelligences as I can. So that's like, you know, visual or kinesthetic or even, you know, acting out a play where I'm, you know, imagining a conversation with Britain and us talking about this piece. Um, I even came up with a really weird interpretive dance to one of the excerpts because I wanted to feel it in my body, you know? Um, and even just imagining if your harp were a character, you know, how in, in this piece or in this music, how would it act? What would it say? You know, is it a diva? Is it like an angel? Is it, you know, maybe a more of a bad girl? You know, you get to embody that character and that emotion um, more fully. And when you do that, you are again, engaging more with that right brain, um, which gives you a lot more juice to work with rather than relying on the sort of mechanical, okay, and now I move my fourth finger to this note, right? Yeah. Um, so it's funny because I've been working on this piece for like 20 years and I learned so much about this piece just from, I mean, and, and sure, I even like, I went down his whole Wikipedia page and I I also learned that he wrote this piece right after he'd had a, a pretty dark experience. And this piece was his, you know, joie de vivre. It like brought him back to life. And so now I he see and hear this piece and I'm like, oh my gosh, I am bringing the audience back to life. That is what's happening right now. And so, you know, so I, I think uh, as much as we can highlighting the things that really help us not only in our relationship with self and self-love and the inner critic and mental health but also how to keep it fun how to keep a sense of play and wonder in what we do um and how to make that accessible to others i love it it's it takes a lot of courage to open up like this i think so i yeah. really appreciate you doing it and it's so Thank incredible you. between your coaching, your talks, and then your blog and more. Like we really get a good sense of who you are. And it's very, again, like very reassuring to know that you can have your own struggle and at the same time, be very good at doing what you're doing and help spread that love. So I really appreciate all that you have shared with us very much. Well, how can we you. know more about your coaching work? Where can we find your blog? Yeah. Where else can you find you? Where you are on the interweb? <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Well, again, I, I just want to thank you for taking this time. Um, Talking Harps is just such a brilliant series. And I'm really, really, really honored to, to be a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I would be delighted to connect with anyone. Um, I, my website is gracebrowningharpist.com and um, on it you will find a link to my blog, The Pursuit of Harpiness, and um, a button to subscribe. Um, I also have a lot of fun um, sharing on social media, so you can find me on Instagram or TikTok at the graceful harpist um, that name. <laughs> and um, yeah I am going to be coming out with some new group coaching um, offerings this month so um, absolutely if you know anyone wants to learn more about that just send me a, a dm as they say or send me a message um, and you know um, I just I love getting to connect with harpists I mean we are the most beautiful and diverse and unique family of, I think, any instrument. <laughs> I agree with your assessment. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And I am, I am just constantly amazed by the sheer number of not only, you know, professionals, but amateur, you know, people who are just coming to the instrument just simply because they just love it and they want to know more. And I think, um, I just think that everyone deserves to have their voice heard. Um, everyone deserves to have the joy of making music. You don't have to be advanced. You can be, you know, 
uh, you can be at any level. And um, I think anyone who just has the the courage to take up something new and to put themselves out there is just amazing and really um, so honorable. So, you know, um, definitely, uh, I, I just love being a part of this community and so grateful to you, Victoria, for um, taking the time with me today. And um, yeah, let's please, please keep in touch. Yes, let's do that. And once again, thanks for your time. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. That would be great. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um.